The views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of WTJX, its board, staff, or underwriters. For joining us for another episode of Recovery in Focus. I'm Adrienne Williams Octolin. Hospitals, schools, roads, housing, and power, these were the recovery priorities outlined by Governor Bryan when the Office of Disaster Recovery was established in 2019. Since then, these long term recovery areas have expanded to include health, human services, public buildings, and utilities. Taking the recovery from an $8 billion to a $15 billion investment in just five years. Despite the completion of over 700 construction projects and expending approximately 500 million per year, the administration recognizes that this is just not enough to get us to the timely end of all projects, especially the more complex ones for housing, hospitals, schools, and utilities. A new path must be forged. Stick with us as we discuss with the Governor Brian what this next phase of the recovery will mean for the territory and what awaits as we navigate the new path. But first, let's take a brief look at other recovery projects making headlines in the territory. From the WTJX studio on St. Croix, I'm Larissa Ellis. For the second time in less than a month, the Department of Sports, Parks, and Recreation celebrated the completion of yet another recovery project, this time on St. Croix for the pavilions at Kramers Park, Commissioner Calvert White commented on the significance of the project. These pavilions symbolize more than just shelter. They represent a commitment to enhancing our beach experience, providing comfort, and fostering a deeper connection with nature. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to join me in the celebration as we officially will be opening the gates to the new chapter in the story of Kramers Park Beach. Governor Albert Bryan Jr., senators, cabinet members, and the St. Croix community attended the ceremony. Funded primarily by local funds, enhancements include ADA-compliant walkways, wind-resistant pavilions, concrete picnic tables, new grills, and free Wi-Fi thanks to VINGN. Parking relief is on the way for travelers at the Cyril E. King Airport on St. Thomas. The $32 million parking and transportation center is nearing completion. The Virgin Islands Port Authority held a public meeting on March 14 to share the status of the project and their plans to partially open the facility, giving motorists access to parking on the second and third floors. Carlton Dow, the authority's executive director, shared what everyone can expect as the project nears completion We'll have 10 uncovered taxi loading spaces. We expect to have nine ADA spaces. And on the second floor, we have 146 covered paid parking spaces for the traveling public, eight ADA paid parking. And um, just so for the public consumption, uh, the car rental is on the first floor. However, the entrance to the parking facility is actually it's going to be on the second floor. So in other words, what we're going to use and what we we'll present here tonight as we do this uh, partial opening will not be the entry when the entire project is completed. In mid-April, the authority projects the opening of 50% of the facility, allowing room for visitor parking. The entire project is expected to be complete before the end of the year. The Department of Planning and Natural Resources celebrated the completion of the Florence A. Williams Public Library on St. Croix on March 20th. The $1.4 million FEMA project took approximately two years to complete and includes extensive interior and exterior repairs. In his remarks, Governor Bryan noted, You see the dedication of the administration to the town, what is the sewer lines that we just put in? People complain about the bumpy roads, but progress is bumpy. 
You look down to the left and you can't see, but the King Christian has come alive. Part of the reason why is the government sell King's Alley Hotel to King Christian. Now that dilapidated building, when I look up the other day on the corner, is now being turned into rooms. You look on the other side, this building down here, the, the, the Virgin Islands government is committed to not letting our buildings go to pot. We're going to continue our progress. DPNR's Commissioner Jean-Pierre Oriol also gave his thoughts on the project's completion. I want to thank all of the individuals from the different agencies, Public Works, VINGN, the Office of Disaster Recovery, VITEMA, the Office of the Governor, Property and Procurement, for the role they played in completing this disaster recovery project. I want to personally thank all of the community volunteers who gave their time and effort over the last several weeks to assist us preparing for this opening. Business owners, contractors, and consultants interested in doing business with the recovery should visit the ODR website for an updated list of open bid announcements and detailed information. This month, the Virgin Islands Water and Power Authority is soliciting bids for qualified contractors for underground electrical construction on Queen Mary Highway, Feeder 5A, and in Hannah's Rest on St. Croix. Additionally, the Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority is seeking qualified firms to provide environmental reviews, assessments, and testing services. To view these and other open bid announcements, as well as up-to-date news on all disaster recovery projects in the territory, log on to www.usviodr.com. Thanks, Larissa. As usual, you are spot on. You know, our territory's top executive, the Honorable Governor Albert Bryan Jr., you know, we had a very, very busy year. Okay, I, I'm going to take that back. We had several busy years, but the busyness has not stopped. We've been on and popping and doing a whole lot of things. And how are you feeling? I'm feeling awesome. <laughs> you got a lot more excitement to go. I mean, every day I wake up, just can't wait to get at it because there's so much to do all the time. Yes. And you know, you're all around, all over the world, doing the people's business. But you know, most recently, the last six months, you've had some national exposure as well, sharing what you've done, appearing on Roland Martin. And oh, yeah. Yeah, you did. I was, I, it was pretty keen to see you on Roland Martin, especially since he pretty much started you off and told you to take it over. <laughs> he told us to take it over uh, back at our leadership conference, and it was great revisiting that. And, you know, the energy that he always brings when he comes to the interview, you know, he wants to know what's happening in the island, how we can connect it to Black America in when he comes back here, why the roads aren't smooth. I know. I heard, I, uh, actually, so, and, you know, that was part of your trip to NGA. What are some of the things that are on a national level that's impacting us here? Ter well, it's what the president is doing. I think the Biden administration, he must have been reading our playbook when he's studying in St. Croix, because what we're doing around energy and the support he's giving us around energy is, is um, very incredible. What we're rolling out, electric vehicles, uh, the solar panels, and all the loans we're being able to give to convert to solar. Uh, when you look at the 60 acres of solar we're doing out in Great Pond and St. Croix, all of those things are because the president is hot on uh, energy and solar. And in home ownership, uh, the president's talking about uh, $400 uh, credit per month for first time home buyers, just like our VI Slice program. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a lot in a lot of ways, you're aligned because even immigration, when he talks about the work that he's doing there, uh, we're trying to get more workers into the islands, he's trying to get more workers into the country to do this massive infrastructure work all over the nation. Yes, you know, the, our work in DC and uh, when we talk about the recovery and the good news that we've gotten. So you know I did a jig when I heard a news about yeah. the match being waived because that's something that we've been working on I, for a I, long time. I saw the jig. You saw the jig. <laughs> <laughs> I called you on the phone and you just happened to be in the building. You was like, what? Yes. Pretty exciting yes. uh, for all Virgin Islanders because we were so worried about how we're going to get this match. And, you know, we I think we talked about everybody we could in Washington, but OMB director, I think, was a final uh, magic trick. She says, nah, we'll see what we could do. And uh, it's not what we expected. It came in a strange way, but it's w it is way more than we expected 
at this point in the recovery. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we've been talking to them and FEMA's been saying that you need more skin in the game. And, uh, and just having conversations back, this has been going on and a potential solution with all the federal partners um, for, for many years, because we've been working on this since 2019. You know, we spoke with Sean Carroll, that is, of the, he's a deputy recovery director for FEMA. And here's what he had to say. In early February, the Biden administration announced a change in the federal cost share agreement with the government of the Virgin Islands. This incentive translates to more than $1.1 billion in additional funding, which is critical due to the sheer size and scope of the recovery operations here in the territory. The additional money will help the territory to repair or replace important facilities like schools, hospitals, water systems, fire and police stations, and other critical facilities. The FEMA team working here in the Virgin Islands is proud to be working on these important projects because many are also survivors, and we are excited to help support the territory at this important time in the recovery process. Well, you know, FEMA has been a real good partner with us uh, from overall, just the bipartisan budget act, the implementation, you know, the disaster was supposed to be an $8 billion disaster. We're now up to potentially $15 billion and the possibility to go greater than that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, when you think about $15 billion, that's like four years of entire economy. Uh, and that's a lot. That's a, I mean, imagine if everybody could work all the time and condense that into four years, we could maybe spend $15 billion. So it's a lot of work ahead, but you know, you got great plans, you got a great team, and I think we're ready and fit for the, for the challenge. And you know I like a good challenge. Well, it is absolutely a, a big challenge for us in our, that we know housing, we know issues that surround it. The fact that we're, we're on an island and everything has to be shipped in, inflation, all of the various factors that impact the pace. But what FEMA did was say, you have to get this done within another 10 years. And the pace that we're on pretty much will have us going for 20 years. But if the waiver and the opportunities that we've received now, if we don't get the, the projects finished within 10 years, then we'll go back to a 95% cost share rather than the 98% cost share that we have. So if we don't get it done in 10 years, we actually lose money. You know the FEMA said I have to be governor till it's done too, Dan. Does that in the... <laughs> <'cause>, <laughs> that wasn't in the package. No, but it is a package. great incentive when you think about it, right? Because, I mean, now even more uh, opportunity and we got to get the money out faster. So we got to work together. I mean, the recovery is one thing where we don't have an opportunity to blink. We got to get this done right. When you look at the things that we're doing now, they're just so far superior and we're taking care of them. For instance, if you look at the South Mali High Annex, which is the Wheatley Skills Center, beautiful mm -hmm. building. You look at uh, the WIC building that we did. Um, that's also an incredible looking piece. You look at um, uh, Walter I.M. Hodge, and what we're doing down there with a the rehab, totally different. So what you're seeing is the word that I hate, now it has to go to design. <laughs> really paying off because what we're producing is something that's far superior to what we had before, even in our road projects. So when you look at what we're doing on the highway uh, in, over in St. Croix, it is just absolutely amazing how they cut that road down and they're breaking in that um, intersection. And there's just so much more coming. Yeah. You know, the other day when it was raining, I was thinking about Gallows Bay and the drainage. Remember, mm -hmm. we done the whole part road. That's part of the spring gut project that we're doing. How better that's draining. Yes. Um, so we, we features that here oh, on yeah. Recovery and Focus. Um, and just the residents there who were very pleased with the work that was done there and making their lives a whole lot better. So we know that health care services in the territory have been a concern for many years. And long before you took office, um, there has been progress in this sector. So we took to the streets. You know, that's where the the litmus test is to talk to residents and caught up with a familiar face along the way. And here's what she had to say. Our healthcare infrastructure, we're doing a lot to renovate our hospitals. Department of Health is going through renovation as well. So just giving the public more information and the status on, of these lot, a lot of these projects. I hear you talk about it all the time, healthcare, just one of your key areas for your administration. So you must be pleased with 
where we are, not necessarily, but definitely where we're going. One of the things that I'm particularly proud, proud about is Charlotte Kimmerman. You know, a lot of our, we've given now, uh, dedicated a million dollars to helping cancer patients get care on the main, mainland uh, through our ARPA funding and, and our uh, partnership with Cancer Centers of the Virgin Islands. So we actually have helped like hundreds of people who wouldn't have otherwise gotten the funding or the level of funding mm -hmm. by doing that. So we, we did a half a million last year. We pledged a half a million this year. And then if, they, if the community matches the half a million, we'll put in another 250,000. Because I mean, even through the pandemic, you, you talk about how difficult it is with people who have chronic diseases that need help that have to go off island. And people here who are not insured um, is a great concern to us because while you may be able to access the hospital, getting your medication or getting uh, equipment that you may need in your home, whether that's something to help you breathe at night or whatever it is, people don't have the access or the money to take care of, th of these things. So for me, our health technology piece that we're working on is even big as well too because now you're going to be able to sit and talk to doctors on the mainland without moving maybe from, even from your home. Um, so I'm really excited about what healthcare does, especially since I'm now 56. I had a birthday the other yeah. day, so I'm especially concerned. But seriously, I think about the people who retired at $14,000 from the government or people who are just existing on just Social Security alone, you know, how are they getting along? How are they getting their medication and able to survive? And some of these people are raising grandchildren, great-grandchildren at the same time. So inflation has been something I've been talking about, mm -hmm. and health care will put you in a poor house. It will. Catastrophic illness. Absolutely. You know, in addition to those initiatives, over a billion dollars has been obligated to health care projects territory-wide. And the Territorial Hospital Redevelopment Team has been pushing through the FEMA process. We spoke to Daryl Smalls. He's the director of the THRT, and here's what he had to say. Great strides are happening across our territory as we rebuild our hospital facilities. Here on the island of St. Thomas, we have commenced with the reconstruction of the Charlotte Kimmelman Cancer Institute. Last year, we completed the demolition phase of this facility, which was damaged by our hurricanes. This project is slated to be completed by the fourth quarter of 2025. On the island of St. Croix, we are completing the phase of the critical administration building. This facility will house all of the administrative personnel who remain within the Governor Juan F. Louis Hospital, and we're slated to be into this facility by this summer, after which we will commence with the demolition phase of the Governor Juan F. Louis Hospital, which will commence early first quarter of 2025. Also on the island of St. Croix, we are in the solicitation phase to develop a five acre lot. This lot will house 250 parking spaces for both staff as well as visitors to the interim Juan F. Louis Hospital on the island of St. Croix. So we have all these healthcare facilities at play. Um, the temporary solution for Juan F. Louis Hospital. Uh, and you heard Mr. Smalls talk about just closing that out and creating parking spaces because you know, hospital construction takes about five years if we're lucky, um, if we're really good. <laughs> and so you still have to subsist in the interim to ensure that you provide health care and making sure that that's moving along. I mean, how important is that to you? I mean, it is really important, especially in St. Croix. You know, I worry a lot because, you know, the, the hospital in St. Thomas has been through a storm and we lost some windows and we got a lot of infrastructure damage that you can't see. But in St. Croix, we're in a temporary shelter, bringing that along very quickly. I mean, look at the uh, dialysis crisis we were looking at the other day. I mean, we don't even have the space in order to move dialysis patients. We, we spend about almost $2 million create, helping a nonprofit create the, a dialysis center here. So I'm always really looking to see how can we augment the healthcare uh, on this island and shore up the hospital. And as sure as people know, uh, the JFL, Juan F. Louis, has been in financial straits for years, even before we had the storm. And they, they continue to struggle along. We gave each of the hospital $10 million. A lot of that they use to incentivize staffing and uh, uh, whatnot. But it's, it's a healthcare system. And we, we plan to have a conference later this year to talk about how all these components together, especially the most important part, 
staying healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to keep people out of the hospital. You're uh, living our best life, our programs with sports, parks and recreation, Department of Health. We're going to be getting out there with battle of the agencies, getting people outside, you know, making sure that they stay heart healthy and no slugs in. No slugs in. <laughs> None at all. I don't think people eat macaroni and cheese and stuff in again without thinking of slugs in. You're almost taking the fun out of it. Yeah, people are looking slimmer than me. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you know, you spoke about um, the, the funding that you were able to give the hospitals. And um, incidentally, I had a conversation with one of the nurses at Wang and Flui, and she said that there were a lot of nurses that came back because of the incentives wow. and the payments. So, you know, there are little seeds that you plant and you, you don't always go back, but when you go back, you'll find that you have maybe fruit that's already bearing. That's why I like running the streets, because you hear the good and you hear the bad as well too. But, you know, I, I was speaking to this one lady in particular who took part in a program that we sponsored to get healthy. She was pre-diabetic and they, they had lessons on how to eat, uh, how to exercise, what to stay away from. And she says, Governor, thanks to the funding that you guys provided, I'm no longer pre-diabetic. Wow. I am healthy. I mean, it's like, that's important. It's just one person could, yes. is important, right? Yes. You know, I, I have to thank FEMA, though, because um, pretty much we had to go back and forth. And the ability to have get full replacements on the most yeah. recent one being Roy Lester Schneider that was hanging out there. And just the opportunity for the territory to rebuild healthcare facilities, synergies across the hospitals. So you don't just have hospitals operating a standalone, but you have a healthcare system mm -hmm. um, in place to be able to do that. I know that you've gotten some sneak peeks on the design for um, Wang F. Louis Hospital. What were your thoughts? I want to cut the ribbon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the facility is like absolutely amazing. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember when the hospital went there, what it did to Sunny Isles. Mm -hmm. This uh, new structure is going to be impactful, as well as the uh, health building, uh, the Donna M. Christian yes. health building that we're putting up. It's going to change the environment um, totally. There's one thing, too, that I believe in, in light and positivity. And when you're sick, you don't want to be in a place that's dark or that's, that's depressing. This building is full of light, you know, and it gives you that hope you need to recover because your mental state is part of the most important thing in terms of staying healthy. Once you get depressed and down, you're, you're in trouble. So I love the design. It's plenty of parking and it's energy efficient. Yes. Energy, energy, energy. I know we're going to talk about it, but Energy is the mantra of the administration in this four years. If we could fix the energy problem, correction, when we fix the energy problem um, in the Virgin Islands, it opens up so much more opportunities, much more than just air conditioning. Much more than that, <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, you not only have um, the healthcare facilities, but we have an opportunity to replace the homes for the age. Yeah. Now, Queen Louise on St. Thomas has a temporary solution that's currently going out to bid um, so that you can stabilize while the new healthcare facility is being developed. And that same opportunity is again available on St. Croix for um, Herbert Grigg. You know, what when you talk about your agenda on the aged, you know, what's the focal point? Well, you know, the, the one thing that we recognize in terms of future planning is we have so many people that are 50 and older. Um, relatively speaking. Well, 50 and older, I mean, we're getting old? <laughs> no, it means we're getting aged. Okay, okay. Just <laughs> like <checking>. wine. <laughs> but there's so many people in that sector that are going to need li the living uh, quarters and more people living alone. More people who want to live, work, and play that don't necessarily need care. Mm -hmm. And then you have a whole generation of, of people that are going to need care, uh, assisted living of some sort. So we're planning for each and every one of that, working with the housing authority. They're building more single units and more units that are, have accessibility um, ease or are in compliance. And that's important as well, too. Um, so as long as we're building everything because we want the VI slice and we want the young people to start building and leap moving and living, we want to make sure that the boomers, as they get older, that they have places um, to accommodate them as well. You got to remember, too, we're talking about a lot of people who worked in tourism, 
uh, industry, maybe for themselves, mm -hmm. maybe for a small business that don't have health benefits, that don't have big retirements. So mm -hmm. you, they want to be able to live in spaces that are not too expensive to cool, easy to access, and uh, comfortable uh, and safe. As the inflation starts to hit, hit us in the Virgin Islands more and more, it's going to be real important that we control costs that we can. Housing, energy, construction, um, just to make sure the quality of life in the Virgin Islands continues to improve. Okay. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad you said that. There's, when people evaluate the progress of the recovery, it's basically for them, schools and hospitals. Mm -hmm. And our schools, you know, we have heard a lot of concerns about the schools and, you know, people are still, they're still a little leery. So let's take a listen of some of the things that we've heard. My main concern is our schools. A lot of them are still in disrepair and there's no set time and completion. I see some is being rebuilt at the moment, but there's no set time and completion. When is that gonna be? And besides that, I understand Arthur Richard is, in, um, is active at the moment and it's gonna be from K1 to 12. Is that a good idea? The kids need more schools, like he promised, and to repair the ones that has been broken from Irma and Maria. And up to now, they have not got it done, you know? And seriously, kids come to me every day and they cry to me and they tell me about this, about the schools, and I just say, you know, somebody got to do something. So first we got to clear it up. Arthur Richards is a K through eight, eight school. It is not K through 12. And you know, the schools and the fact that these schools are damaged and we still had to maintain providing education and the process for FEMA, you know, what kind of consternation does that, that cost you? Oh, <laughs> did I say I hate the design word <laughs> and the plan word? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those people like, I, I just want to get on a horse and ride. I don't, you know, I'll figure out where I'm going later. But you see the benefit of, of really taking your time and planning. And you see, you're going to see the benefit of the Bipartisan Budget Act. Because we could have gone ahead and just patched these schools up and then they would fall apart again five years later. We're building new schools. Um, the infrastructure for some of these schools 60 years old. I mean, I went to them uh, when I was a kid. And some people, even their parents, like, went to them. You know, I, I listen to people talk about the K through 12 thing. All the schools that are the premier, so to speak, schools, private schools in the Virgin Islands are K through 12. Country Day Good Hope, Antilles, Anglican School, Montessori, they're all K through 12. So I don't understand what is the concern about having all of those grades uh, in the same school. And one of the things that is a benefit, you know, we lose kids in seventh grade. I could tell you, I was one of those kids. When I went to seventh grade, I was 10 years old. It was traumatic. I was going to school, a different school, changing classes with kids that were much older than me. Now you have the same school environment when you move to seventh to eighth. So you're getting that consistency in the young child. And then when you go to ninth grade, you're prepared um, to do high school work. And we, because we're building a new high school at Central. We also built in a new one, Charlotte Amali High uh, in St. Thomas. So it, trust me, it's going to be worth the wait. I was down at Arthur Richards well, last week, maybe like Thursday, and you could see the cement coming through the earth yes. and all the groundwork that's being done. A lot of drainage mm -hmm. um, infrastructure being put in there as well too. Um, so it's really looking good. And I, I'm looking forward to getting the other ones built as well too. You know, Governor, there's a whole lot that goes into um, getting funds to actually get schools started. And um, we've been working to ensure we get the funds. And as quickly as the funds have been obligated, we're starting that process for the design, and if you're talking about. And sometimes the de design takes a year. So, you know, the first part of that is getting the money from FEMA. And I think it's always very important to sensitize the public to the fact that for the first three to four years that we've not had any money for the schools, any permanent dollars. And, you know, we can't start without having funds. And there's a line of credit that allowed us to maybe get to the point where the design is happening until we can get schools started. So 
getting schools out and um, you're anticipating getting how many schools out during your term? I'm hoping we get all six, <laughs> <laughs> but I know that, you know, time is of the essence and, you know, the economy could do, can hold so much uh, when you think about the, uh, the rate of unemployment that we have now is the lowest in the history of the Virgin Islands. How do you get more schools done? You need more people mm -hmm. and uh, people is a challenge not only here and across the nation. The other thing I always like to tell people, there are, there, is, there are no challenges here that are not evident in every part of the nation. When I go to National Governors Association, they have workforce challenges, they have recovery mm -hmm. challenges and disaster challenges, they have home problems then in terms of finding housing uh, for people, they have uh, construction problems in terms of the inflation and what they're experiencing. So, it's not unique to us. We're not going, we're a small part of a, a massive American economy. Um, but what's the, the good news is, is that we have the opportunities to build yes. schools. Yes. So over 60% of the schools in America need to be rebuilt. We, uh, through the Bipartisan Budget Act, now have a, uh, an opportunity not only to fix schools, but to actually build new schools um, that are gonna be around for another 40 or 50, 50 years. Energy efficient, weather resistant, and most of all, really super conducive learning centers for our children. I, I mean, when we talk about the St. John uh -huh. and those same opportunities and Julia Sproul and being able to get this, move this needle that has been going on for like, what, 20 years? 50. 50 years <laughs> that under your administration, we were able to get the land swap and now we're beginning to build K through 12 in Julia Sproul. That'll be the only K through 12 in the Virgin Islands. And it's not only just a K through 12. It's like, you know, you have to go to St. John to understand the problems. Like when we have a storm, we don't have anywhere that we could make a storm shelter. If we have a community meeting, we always have to do it in the legislature, which is tiny mm -hmm. and is really not equipped because it's set up like a legislature to do some of the kind of things that we want. So. We want to have a community center. We want to have a school. We want to have a safe space for doing summer camp. And we really want to be able to theme the school so that maybe it's a school that studies environment or, or music. You or sound like you arts. want to go back to school. You I wish I could. When I wait, and you see the diagrams of the new schools that we're building, I mean, it's yes. top notch. Top notch. Seeing is believing. You know, and when, when the Arthur Richards really start to get uh, out of the ground, people are going to see the level of school we are demanding for our children. Absolutely, to industry standards. So, you know, in Gladys Abraham on St. Thomas, they're getting ready for students to start there because the skills center will now be down at Gladys Abraham and the work is pretty much almost completed, just waiting for it to get uh, in our uh, furniture uh, into that facility. You're another ribbon cutting potentially. And by the fall, we'll be operating out of that facility in Gladys Abraham. Boy, I can't wait for that. And, you know, we found some uh, grant funding that we're going to be able, we think, we're still looking at it, we're going to be able to do some amazing things with the type of equipment. One of the things that have always um, galled me, but and I made a campaign promise, that we were going to bring more technical education and mm -hmm. training centers to the island of St. Thomas. Uh, the Wheatley Skills Center, in comparison to the complex uh, technical center, is like comparing apples to raisin, not even to orange. Oh, wow. And we need to have that skill training on that island to make sure that we're producing. Coupling with that, we really are this close to being able to have our technical college set up. So you'll be able to go to high school and actually graduate with a two-year uh, associate's degree. That from the is university. phenomenal. You yeah. know, there's actually more good news to come from school. So we're going to hear from Commissioner Dion Wells Hedrington. Take a listen. We are here at the Central High School site, which is going to be the new build for the Virgin Islands Department of Education. We are excited that we are going to be able to replace this entire campus. Right now, we are in the contracting phase, and we're looking to execute this contract within the next 30 to 60 days. Once the contract is executed, then we begin to finish the design, which is 30% complete 
Assembly so that we can start the construction of the new Central High School. The designs that we have thus far have been shared with the public as well as the students. Those designs are beautiful. Aren't they? Yes. You notice all those designs have solar panels on them too. That's right. Energy. Energy, <laughs> energy, energy. I, housing is also one of the challenges that we know all too well. And the, the territory faces a lot. And here's some concerns that were echoed from our residents. My main concern is the fact that there are still so many homes still damaged, not repaired. There were supposed to be monies for assistance. What happened? I see there's a lot of material sitting at a particular site in Alexander and it's just exposed to the elements and yet people homes are without roofs. When are these projects going to take place? You know, people need to, you know, to see some something happening and it's not. Envision oh. is, is quite a challenge and, you know, we continue. There are a lot of people who are still waiting for their roofs to be fixed. Not only the roofs, but you know, full replacement of homes. Because there's I, a lot I of homes. I think it's just a misnomer that people, you know, we we they think of just replacing the roof. I was uh, visiting uh, with one of the Envision uh, applicants uh, who was getting ready to get construction. When I heard how much it was to fix her home, I was appalled. Might as well build her a new one. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the construction. Now, the roof rafters were four foot and center. Mm -hmm. Now they need to be two. Then she had parts of her roof that were joined to other parts that were disjointed because some of her rafters were 36 and center too. Right. And then the roof slopes and it cantilevers. And then all our outside walls were six inches. Six inches, yeah. So, I mean, I, you, when you start to add up all of those things, and because her roof looking, her kitchen is damaged too. All the interior tiling and everything, all of that has to be replaced. So... You get it, but you don't get it. And it's incredibly expensive to do this. And the one thing, you know, that I always say, you, I'd rather build new. Because when you dig a wall, you never know what you're going to find. So by the time they get to doing that, all her electrical, everything has been affected by the water that has been dripping there over the years. So the Envision program, the roofing program, is a complex program. But you get, you're getting it going. Well, you know, let's take a listen to, to Greg Miller. He's our manager for the Envision program, and he's going to give us an update. Currently, we are processing over 200 applicants. There's nine homes in construction, and 30 homes have been completed. Since ODR has become a sub-recipient of the CDBGDR program, we have been working with leadership and our contractors on ways to accelerate the program. By the end of March 2024, we are expecting to publish a solicitation package of up to 75 homes. In addition, we are submitting 10 homes per month for construction to our contractor person services. I would like to thank the applicants of the Envision Tomorrow program for their patience. I ask for your cooperation in submitting any outstanding documentation if contacted by one of our housing specialists. If you have any questions or would like a status update on your application, please contact our office at 888-239-3387. There's a push uh, now, and you know, Mr. Miller said to make sure that when the housing specialists reach out, that we get the documentation in. There's a lot of it's a it's paper intensive, of course, and the docu it's all about eligibility and all the documentation. And we know that a lot of the applicants have been submitting documentation over and over again. So we do ask for your patience. Uh, we really want to get to your home, so we ask that once you're contacted. Let's make sure that you secure your spot because we are, the, the train is moving, it trying is to make moving. sure that you get your homes fixed. And the Virgin Islands Housing Authority is also making significant progress on the Walter I. M. Hodge project on, in Frederickstead. Jay Benton, project manager, Colleen Swayze, gives us an update. Since the ribbon cutting for phase one last October, Jay Benton Construction has successfully completed seven additional buildings providing new homes for 82 families on St. Croix. This highlights our commitment to delivering high quality homes and creating vibrant communities in the Virgin Islands. I'm proud to announce that we're kicking off work on site amenities such as basketball courts, a playground, and a community planning area. This phase represents an exciting step forward in creating a dynamic and engaging space for residents to enjoy. Check back in at the end of summer to see this finished project. 
You want to take a bet that the end of summer is going to be done? No, I bet on Benton. <laughs> <laughs> bet on Benton. You know, the funny thing is, with this project, especially when I talk about, you know, you see, I can remember, you know, over the years, with working in housing, working working at uh, the refinery, every, you see these mock-up models. Mm -hmm. And when it's built, if it's built, if it's, you know what mock-up models we have that have never been built? We're actually seeing these things come to life. And I have to look closely at the picture because it looked like a picture. Mm -hmm. It was the actual community. Um, that's how good a job they have been doing in terms of rebuilding that space. And uh, people act differently when they have uh, quality housing. You know, it's like when you go into some place and your grass all neatly cut, you ain't seen a trust. People don't throw trash on the ground. Um, there's a lot of pride Yes, that people definitely. have in those new, new um, Definitely homes. have beautiful. a lot of pride. Um, it's, it is. Uh, we took, had the opportunity to tour uh, Walter M. Hodge recently where we looked at just the fact, the process in constructing in an area that actually has residents. It's one thing to be working on a site that's free of folks yeah. that's living there, but actually an occupied site. Um, took some skill and um, so far so good and we're trending to the end so really looking forward to the work that's being done there you know i'm gonna switch a little bit to wapa but not power wapa water <laughs> you know when you think of wapa you just think of power you don't think of water wapa water except um in the last couple of months we, oh we won't talk about that <laughs> yeah we won't but the water that. quality in that area has been a major concern and the virgin Islands water and power authority has been doing its best to provide relief but a permanent solution is actually needed. And we reached out to Director Chanel Peterson, our communications of WAPA, and she had a little bit to share on it with us. I'm here today at the Hannah's Rest Water Rehabilitation Project. This project is funded through the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA's Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. This is about a $3.1 million project, and the project is replacing the old ductile and iron pipes to PVC piping. Um, there's going to be a replacement for about 10,800 feet in this area that's going to improve the quality of water for residences in this area. Um, in addition to that, customers can expect construction activities, um, scheduled water outages, and so be sure to sign up for WAPA alerts, as well as dust and other debris as they continue to conduct construction to repair the pipes in this area. This is part of the many projects that are being conducted right now across St. Croix that is estimated to be about $1 billion investment into the island. You know, she kind of like slid the, you're going to have some dust and yeah. you're going to be you digging have a lot up. Of dust. You have a lot more dust, <laughs> a lot of noise, um, really bad roads until they actually fix it. You know what stuck out to me about that um, piece there? 10,800 feet. A mile is what, 5,865 feet, something around there? Almost two miles of piping. Um, in just in that neighborhood, when you think about the project now to do the entire St. Croix with our new water uh, piping. Now, something that we have embarked upon now for a while, but we continue to do plan and all of these things coming on. So it's a lot of work yes. uh, and you have to do that. And then they have to reconnect all of those people. Um, so WAPA, WAPA has a lot of good to talk about, mm -hmm. but usually we just hear about the bond. So. Well, you know, it's, it's a tremendous effort. Um, I do want to take my hat off to Noah Hodge and his team for the consistent work that they're doing. WAPA Water is always kind of hanging behind of WAPA Power, but some really hardworking folks in there just trying to get some quality water. It's our water to not be brown, you know. It's, <laughs> yeah. just, it's, it's, it's our work in progress and we'll continue to do so. And no, but power, of course, we've been talking about energy. You had some really um, good news to share with the community on the energy front, solar, just, some of the futuristic solutions that we're planting the seed now and we're just about to bear fruit. Those, those projects are going to completely change the landscape. And, you know, having the discussions this week, you're going to have like 62 megawatts in St. Croix. That's more renewable power than we have daytime peak. Wow. So it peaks at 45 in St. Croix. Now, the 
it doesn't always produce 62 megawatts but power this cloud cover rainy days um, but it's being coupled with batteries so the goal is to be producing enough power that we could store them in these batteries and then run them in the night when the sun isn't shining right in addition we are also like I've just come from working on this lease uh, speaking to Donna Fred Gregory on the phone about how we can get this lease for the wind turbines to go up uh, in, in Bovoni. I think that's another four or five megawatts of power, coupled with our solar loan program that we have at 1% that we're giving out these loans that you could pay like your WAPA bill, um, which is great. And then the, the electric vehicle piece is, is why you just like really excited about. I kind of kidnapped the Vitran bus we, the we, other day. We, we saw you. It, <laughs> <laughs> somebody, some, I was talking to somebody, they said, I could have sworn I saw you driving a bus in Christian's Yes. Well, I, I got a couple of job offers, by the I, way. I, People want yeah, me to drive excellent, for them. You're probably an excellent <laughs> bus driver. I kid Commissioner Gabriel. He was sitting in the back of the seat just bouncing up like the little kids. Like, this is, looks like you guys were having a whole lot of fun. We did have a lot of fun. Well, that thing rides like butter. Um, it, it rides really good. But uh, we're going to be putting in the charging stations, which I'm like, super excited about, um, all over the three islands to encourage people um, to get this electric vehicle. Um, and we, we, you know, we want smaller cars, more efficient cars, which gives us more parking, less impact on uh, our climate and our environment, less runoff and, of oil and stuff and debris into our manholes and drains that get into our oceans and kill our fish and our I coral. Kill our fish. It's just like 100% good, the stuff that we're making the move towards renewables. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of work, undergrounding projects as well. Um, Hannah's Rest, work that's going on, Queen Mary Highway, you know, sewer replacements, just all kinds of good utility work that's going on. Um, there's some work that, that the sewer replacement has been done in Garden Street, Savan, Moravian Gut, everything on St. Thomas. We have had a lot of work done, but there's so much more to be done. And the one dig approach is actually going to be accomplished if we move forward with bundles. It's going to be it's going to be accomplished, but once again, painstaking, lots of design work, lots of planning to get all of that stuff aligned and dug. Dig one, so. Yeah, I tell people you don't wake up and just start to build a house. If you want to get a house, it takes a lot of planning, right. a lot of design, you know. If you have a husband and you, your wife wants a big kitchen. A lot of fighting. And all, sometimes a lot of fighting. <laughs> it's bigger than the money that you have. You know, all of that goes in. So if you're thinking about that in a single family home, and when we talk about um, 10,000 feet mm -hmm. of pipe or um, $100 million facilities, you can just mm -hmm. imagine what kind of planning is necessary to be done. The most critical aspect of our, of our infrastructure and of a strong infrastructure's roads. And the community, of course, has some concerns. So let's take a listen. My questions I have for the governor is, what are you going to do about the state of the potholes? And my concern is, can you guys make the workers work overnight when there's less traffic versus when they're doing it in the day when there's a lot of traffic? I mean, it's a big issue because there's too much going on in the day and it slows you down for like parents that picks up their kids on their break, which is probably a half an hour to an hour. Our roads, they're in real bad conditions. We need some help in St. Croix when it comes to the roads. You know, there, there are no good portion of it for us to drive on. And when we go to the, the authority here in St. Croix, they are letting us know that their hands are tied, there's nothing they can do. Um, I think Governor Bryan did a really good job in terms of our physical infrastructure because we are seeing so many roads being paved. In fact, this is the first time that I have seen lights on the highway for the, you know, in a long time. So that's a good thing. Well, you know, roads, roads and more roads. We've roads. paved a lot of roads. A lot. Uh, and we also, the lights on the highway. Now, I complain about the lights on the highway as well because it's pretty dark and we've started to get um, work done on portions of it. And I think, that, not think, but the uh, additional 
phase of the road that needs to be completed. That's about to be in contracting so that we can get that done. So we expect the highway to be fully lit um, before the end of the year. But what are your, what is your plan for roads? So you fix some, by the time you fix some, it rains, and then there's undergrounding work that's going to be going on. And, you know, road work is pretty painful. It is pretty painful. And, you know, my idea nobody likes. They say we, uh, we get a... a a proposal to pave all the roads in the territory that need to be repaired. And let's say it's going to take us five years, maybe 10 years to do all of it. We exclude all of the uh, FEMA uh, roads, all of the one dig roads. When we start to do it, I, I realize a lot of people complain about neighborhood roads. We paved a lot of neighborhood roads. Mm -hmm. And the roads that, most of the roads that you see that haven't been paved, are, it's because we're coming along with some kind of digging that we got way to do it. We don't want to do it. But... I think we need to implement a half a percentage point tax, income tax, across the board to everybody, and pave all the roads. Um, now, you, so how, how is it going with that proposal? That, I, you, know, every, you know, nobody in my cabinet likes it. Uh, nobody <laughs> in my, my uh, wheelhouse likes it. Well, I mean, it's an opportunity, though, to... I, I would like it to go on a ballot and let people vote. Because if you vote no, then you don't want your road paved. So... We're talking about if you got a check, let's say, of eight hundred dollars, you would pay eight dollars wow. for well, like a, a a a pay period for like a period of ten years. I mean, it's worth it uh, for better roads because those roads will never get get fixed. I mean, now that we're almost finished the highway, we could see parts of the highway that are already starting to fall apart. And when you talk about time, we got the mahogany road project in tw the money for that in twenty fifteen. We start and work this year, 2024, that's through yeah. the rainforest. And it's going to take two years. At least two years to hit. So, you know, there's a lot of road. There's the bridge projects that's going on, oh, yeah. East Airport Road, Queen Mary. You know, it's a lot of work that has been done to your point, Governor. That has been Dallas Bay Road, Carlton Road, just different aspects of our, our infrastructure, but there's still a lot more to be done. So, you know, this capacity, right. all these projects, we've, we've probably spoken about um, 10, 20, 40 million dollars in projects for half of the year. Right. Um, when we talk about this, there's issues with workforce and housing and those challenges, you know, what are our plans? So, you know, we've, got, we've done this before. Uh, in the 70s, the population tripled. In order to accommodate the Virgin, in, uh, Virgin Islands economy, it created a power plant that couldn't produce power enough for it, split session schools, overcrowded hospitals. You know, but this time we know what's going to happen, so we're planning for that. And that's where USVI Rebuild uh, comes into play. Um, and all the stuff that we're, you're putting together at ODR kind of anticipating the need mm -hmm. and doing it in a in a very deliberate way that controls costs that brings construction to some reasonable rate of inflation and puts more people in houses and uh, better hospital and schools quicker i mean the prices that we're seeing for these projects it's just th through the roof and yeah. I, I was shopping um, in, in plaza i was picking up a couple of things and i started complaining to myself Thought I was complaining to myself until somebody answered me. I was like, why is the pineapple $6? And I was like, I don't know either. I was like, oh, I was that loud? <laughs> <laughs> it's just the fact that there, we see it in everywhere and inflation, and inflation is not only affecting your regular life, but we everything. see it, it, it impacts everything. Everything. People asking me what you know I'm going to do after I, I stop being governor. I said, get my electrical exam and pass and become an electric electrician because they're getting paid more than anybody else. And the plumbers and the contractors, um, you know, the, the thing we try to always say is it's a different Virgin Islands now. You could be reasonably priced because we got work forever. Mm -hmm. Like we all, if we took everybody in the Virgin Islands and put them to work right now, give everybody a contract, we will still have work forever. I think just the schools that we have out now is more, there's $850 million in school projects out right now. That's more work than we had bonding in the Virgin mm -hmm. Islands. Yeah. If you put all the contractors together, you couldn't come up with $850 million worth of bonding. Just And, and we just starting. Um, in terms of the massive 
infrastructure projects. What do you say to the students in the schools, the contractors, and anyone here in the territory about what's about to happen with rebuilding these Virgin Islands? I think it's about to go on steroids. Uh, we've, we've spoken to the big contractors all over the mainland and have gotten them to come down and they're willing to uh, put their back into it. The planning that is going into now, bundling these packages together in billion dollar uh, packages are, is gonna just accelerate the uh, project management, super project management office where billing is consolidating the best resources in the government in the Virgin Islands to help get these things out quicker. So it's not only gonna improve the recovery, but it's gonna improve the entire government now because departments like health, exactly. which were inundated with the recovery, can now focus on keeping people healthy. We're gonna take them out from being contractors and go back to providing health and all of the, your mission oriented, back to, back to the basics. You know, it is a lot. We're looking at uh, ribbon cuttings, because you know, Scissors and shovels. Scissors and shovels, <laughs> groundbreakings, ribbon cuttings. It's it just this, it is actually the testament to the work that's being done. And we like a good party anyway. And you so we did the Florence Williams Library. We have the Enid Bar will be in construction before the end of the, well, the notice to proceed for Enid Bar before the end of this month. And we're also um, continuing work on Peterson Library in Frederickstead. So, Governor, you haven't forgotten the people of Frederickstead. I have not. And also... Have you seen the boardwalk at night? You need to go to Frederickstead and oh, walk the waterfront oh, at night. You, you don't have to tell me. West Side <laughs> every day, all day. Turnbull <laughs> so, is in Turnbull construction. Turnbull is in construction. So, um, this year, getting all the libraries completed, the, the community was very welcoming of the fact that Florence Williams Library is back on track and all of the parks, the yeah. parks coming back online. And, you know, great work that's being done with um, the basketball courts, uh, Joseph Abain, Emil Griffith, lighting. You see, they, they, they knocked down the, the dugouts to um, Kanigata. Yes. If people, somebody complain about them. I say, you know, there's never a good time to walk on a field because it's so busy. And then the big field, I know we got a lot of work coming along on that as well. Lionel Roberts. You know, I saw people playing uh, down there the other day, so it's good. Yes, good stuff. So, you know, we have a lot going on, and um, we have a lot more to, to, to be done. And we're looking at uh, housing. We're looking at Head Starts. Those Head Starts, head starts are, are coming along. Oh, they are. You know, Anna's Hope, Concordia, Minetta Mitchell, Lindbergh, Belongo, all of these. Cruise Bay. Cruise you know, we passed pass by the Cruise Bay. Governor, just... Projects galore. What do you have to say and take us home? I was saying, you know, this rebuild and this recovery is more than a recovery. It's a revolution of infrastructure uh, for the Virgin Islands and its people. Looking forward to it. You are governor at a time when it's a once in a lifetime generational opportunity. Do you accept the challenge? I accept the challenge. Thank you, governor. I don't think we can <laughs> squeeze one more blessed thing in this uh, session here today. You can absolutely stay up to date by visiting us online at usviodr.com. And you can also keep this discussion going at facebook.com forward slash WTJX. Thank you for watching. We'll continue to build a legacy of resilience.